Welcome back, everyone. Day three of the Cube Silicon Angles Media Week here in New York City, our East Coast studios here at the NYSE New York Stock Exchange. Big day today in IPO. Ingram Micro uh, went out public. Big uh, action happening here. Obviously, connecting Silicon Valley and Wall Street. That's what we do. NYSE is a great place. A lot of action. Also, it's private equity week as well. All the top people in private equity here gathering, talking about all the issues. Here in the queue, we are in the balcony overlooking the show floor. And Ned Gannon, the founder of Cohesio, his AI is here. Ned, thanks for coming on the queue. Thanks so much for having me, John. So great to see you the other night at the NYSE Wired uh, reception. Brian Bauman and team put on with the Cube as well. Um, great list of founders there. I mean, it really kind of was an alpha moment. A lot of alpha founders because AI is attracting a lot of talents. Um, and not just the young guns. I mean, we're you know <laughs> you're bringing in experienced people who are seeing probably what's going to be mo the most prolific investment wave uh, in generations, um, and that's the big story that's going on. And again, there'll be some air coming out of the balloon, but it won't pop. We're predicting that on the key research. Yeah. Uh, you got a great startup. You're coming at it from a, a very practical angle, but there's scale where you're coming from. You got a great opportunity uh, applying AI and. Uh, it's in an area that's in a, with a lot of domain expertise, legal. For, for sure, for sure. So I had started my career as a corporate attorney, and uh, it's interesting. You mentioned a lot of new people coming into AI and getting started in the space. I've actually been in the space for some time. I had started another AI-focused legal tech company uh, back in 2012, um, and that was very early days. <laughs> we faced a lot of skepticism from attorneys, yeah. uh, but built the company up, sold it to a public company in 2018. Yeah. Uh, so Cohizo is my my second AI-focused uh, legal tech venture. Well, it's interesting. It's like another bite at the apple, so to speak, as, you know, as we're in New York City, good to the big apple. Yeah. But I mean, let's talk about the transition because if you go back to 2010, 2012, that's when the Cube started in 2010, 15 years ago. You know, machine learning and supervised, unsupervised machine learning was a big kind of thing. And, and predictive analytics was a big thing. And also big data, all the fintech companies, all the big banks were using uh, big data centers and moves in the cloud. Cloud started coming on the scene. So you started to see that Gen 1 scratching mm. the surface of, mm -hmm. okay, there's a lot of data in the, in the law firms, a lot of workflows, a lot of knobs. So yeah, I can see that working, yeah. um, not scaling to the extent of, okay, you get bought out, but that's still work that's done. I'm sure there was some good use cases there, but now yeah. everything's on the table because now you got multimodal, got computer vision, which essentially allows you to take PDFs, which is images, yeah. uh, and obviously language models are huge. So these foundation models really kind of put a new categorical spin on the opportunity. Share your thoughts it, on that. It, it is a categorical spin. I mean, the opportunity is huge. Um, Goldman actually came out with a report where they predicted 44% of uh, legal tasks could be automated with Gen AI. That was more than any other industry other than administrative and clerical work. Uh, so it's a very exciting opportunity in legal. Uh, language is the coin of the realm, and that's yeah. certainly very conducive to a product like we ours. Were we were talking before we came on uh, in the studio off camera about your background in M&A. You used to flip through books, um, paper copies, and then again, things were, were manual that way. Um, when you look at things like um, reporting, you look at things like preparation, due diligence, um, you're scouring, you're essentially trying to search. Yeah. One of the killer apps in AI is retrieval. Sure. Reg, reg, you know, retrieval augmentation generation is the technical term, but mm -hmm. at the end of the day, search is the killer app uh, for what we're seeing in AI. Now, there's a lot of other killer apps, but at the end of the day, servicing insights, searching documents, finding what you're looking for. It sounds like the old Google business model back in the day. We're just trying to find what you're looking for. <laughs> this is kind of a big deal. It, it, it is a big deal, and I would say uh, native or vanilla RAG isn't always totally conducive to legal specifically. Um, so with Cohizo, we've augmented that with proprietary technology, but you're exactly right. It's identifying relevant sections, relevant documents, and then generating responses based on those. Uh, one of the things we're focused on Cohizo is it's a legal front door and work management system. So as folks on the business side are asking questions of the legal department, it can surface insights and provide answers based on that organization's policies, contracts, and other yeah. documentation. Uh, so really take those questions off of the legal department's plate. Ned, I want to get into setting the table and explaining you know, the venture, the origination, what you guys, where you guys are on your status, funding, and, and, and progress. Before, you, but before we get into that, I want to talk about you know, really kind of this wave that we've been talking about all week, and we've been saying this on theCUBE for the past year, 
Uh, obviously, the technical term is horizontally scalable, vertical specialization, AI fits beautifully. But what's going on in this wave, and people always ask me, but John, why is this wave so important besides the, the, the massive investments coming in, is that you're an example of applications mm. that are innovating. At the same time, under the covers, there's massive innovation in hardware and performance. So yep. you got all this kind of supercomputing for the masses that was once relegated to the nerds that would do high performance computing or you know the, the monster data like ICE here, the parent company NYSE, mm -hmm. they have this monster data center. And like there's people who just work on all that hardware yep. that provide the performance. And then the apps would come on later. Here we're seeing application innovation and the technology under the cover. You are going after legal. This is not normal. This was never never seen this been other ways before. Usually you, you wait for the performance and then you go after the, the applications. You're in the legal vertical. Yeah. And so you have all this goodness available and it's still innovating on the under under the belly. So so you got under the covers, expansion, more horsepower coming. Yeah. More yeah. chips. For sure. For and sure. You're just it's cruising right along. Yeah, I mean, it's an incredibly exciting time, and I think that underscores really the need to be nimble and have the technical expertise on the team to take advantage of some of the latest innovations and incorporate them into our application as well. Yeah, we'll get into that. Give us the stats on the company, when it was founded, where, what's the status, give us, give us, give us some of the, the facts. Yeah, so uh, founded in April of 2023. Um, myself, uh, as I mentioned, kind of a legal domain expert background, experience yeah. scaling a legal tech company uh, through an exit. My three co-founders are all AI-focused technical engineers, <laughs> so they've uh, built other legal tech products. Uh, they've been through a graduate program at Carnegie Mellon University. Yeah. Um, Not too shabby comp comp side program there. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. They're known for neural networks, by the way. Carnegie Mellon, well-versed, going back decades in AI. Yeah, for sure. Definitely one of the, the leading universities. Um, in fact, Carnegie Mellon is an investor in Cohezo. So um, together with Carnegie Mellon, we also have investment from uh, four other VCs, as well as some uh, angel investors with legal domain expertise, yeah. um, including the former uh, COO of legal at UBS. Talk about the legal tech because you know I was um, I'm seeing a lot of innovations. There's so many use cases I can see emerging. For instance, I was just at a security conference with Google Security. They bought a company called Mandiant. They do a lot of cybersecurity stuff, which has a big compliance mm. and reporting requirement. And uh, you know, one of the things that Kevin Mandia would say is like, hey, you know, last year AI helps us write the reports faster. Now this year they're also doing threat hunting. So they went from doing some of the blocking and tackling, chopping wood, carrying water, all those mundane tasks of reporting, because yeah. no one likes to do a report. I got breached, oh, there's an incident, I got to write a report. Right. And it's, it's legal compliance. So it's yeah. not like it's like just write a summary report. Sure. It's like you got to check the boxes. Right. Which is, right. again, you need help on that. So it's really, it's in the weeds. And this is where the low-hanging fruit is. Can you share your thoughts? Because I'm sure legal has a lot of that compliance. There's a lot of, obviously, law is law. Yeah, yeah. So I think one of the points you make that's really interesting on the compliance side is how do you leverage technology to prevent some of those items from becoming issues? So I know from my own experience, sometimes in a, in a large company environment, there's something you want to do. You know there's a policy that governs it. It takes time to find it, much less tease out an answer. Um, and if people are skipping that piece of the process, it's increasing risk for the, for the business. Um, so with an application like Cohezo, easy to ask questions of the system, get very finite responses back, always links to evidence in the relevant policy where it's highlighted to show the, the text that was used to derive the answer. Um, yeah. So you can look to stem some of those potential risks for the organization. Talk about the uh, the company's product. How do they people buy it? Is the main thing productivity? What's Is it workflow specific? How do you implement it? Take us through how you guys engage with customers. Yeah, so um, definitely a, a big producti productivity play here. Um, essentially, the way the product works is we look to meet business users where they're at. So if they mm -hmm. typically engage with the legal department through Outlook or Slack or Teams, we have integrations. Um, folks can ask questions. If those questions can be answered based on the company's policies, contracts, or documentation, the system provides a response together with a link to evidence. Now the legal or compliance department can also decide, do they want to vet the responses before they go back uh, to the business user? So they have a lot of control over the process. And then for more complex requests that do require human level involvement, the AI will prioritize, delegate, and track those within the system. Yeah. And then finally, there's a whole host of analytics to yeah. surface insight as to how work is it's flowing. It's funny, you know, you, I mean, these applications, they all have the same kind of pattern, workflow specific, domain specific reducing the steps it takes to do something, mm -hmm. making it easier to use. I mean, this is kind of like the when you see these waves, these new step function gains come in, 
Um, is there use cases where you can point to that say, okay, for most of the legal teams we work with, these are the easy entry points, knock down a few wins, as they say in baseball, hit a single, get yeah, on base, yeah. don't try to hit the long ball, don't swing for the fences. And then what those use cases open up, because it's almost a pattern now we're seeing where, okay, there's some low-hanging fruit. For sure. And then people go, wow, I could do other things. And then yeah. the idea of agents and co-pilots come in. Yeah, yeah. Where they go, wow, I see other things. So take us through the low-hanging fruit entry opportunities uh, for value creation. And then what do people normally see next when they go, oh, wow. Yeah, so it's really interesting, and I'm glad you raised implementation because I think in some for some legal tech tools, that can be a challenge. It can be a year or two before you start seeing ROI. Uh, Cohezo has a very simple implementation process. So you we either integrate with your current repository or you upload documents to the system. You can drag a whole file tree in, the system will process them, and then you can be, begin asking questions right away. Um, it's typically a 45 minute to an hour training session for the end user and, and you're ready to go. Um, so what we typically see is we'll establish a beachhead within an organization. Often it's the legal department, yeah. sometimes the compliance department, sometimes just a group within those departments. And then we look to build from there. Uh, interestingly, the system also has applications for human yeah. resources, really any function specific department within the enterprise. Is it mostly there? It's all, all their data, right? So it's not like it's external data. I mean, this law is public. I mean, you can, the law books can be scanned. ChatGPT does that. Yep. How, how much of this is correlating between the old models and the kind of proprietary you know, asset of the customer. Yeah, yeah. So currently, all of the responses are based off of the data of the customer themselves. So often with AI, you hear about the potential for hallucinations as yeah. it's pulling in various sources across the internet. Um, with this, it's all tied very, very tightly back mm -hmm. to the company's documents. Now, it's interesting. We have gotten some requests uh, from clients to also put the system, uh, have the system engage with a trusted source external to the organization. Yeah. So that's something we're exploring as well. Yeah, you gotta, gotta put guardrails on that. I mean, we're seeing people actually kind of keep that separate and then kind of create a trusted delegation relationship that's been vetted. Because of, because of the leakage, you got also security prompt injections, yeah. context yeah. poisoning, these are threats that are coming in. Uh, and also, you might not even need it. Right. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, the vast majority of folks are very happy with getting the answers from their documents. The, the other thing I would mention, too, which is interesting, uh, we have seen people using the system where as they're responding to questions and getting legal department sign off on various responses, those are going back into the database that's feeding the model. So it, the system continues yeah. to get smarter over time, becomes very sticky, tailors itself to the organization. It's interesting. I want to ask you how you guys are targeting your um, go to market, because, I mean, you're talking about legal ops. Yep. basically legal operations, because you come in and essentially streamline a lot of things, but your customer are the frontline workers. How do you guys, who's the persona, who do you guys target when you go in and, and, and pitch the value proposition? What is the, what's the motion look like? Yeah, so the interesting thing is both sides, both the business <laughs> side and the legal side have a lot of pain points associated with this use case. Yeah. Um, so on the business side, maybe you're a salesperson and you get a, you send, submit a contract to legal, it gets hung up, it delays time to revenue, delays time to commissions, uh, maybe opens up an opportunity for a competitor to come into the mix. If you're someone in procurement on the business side, you're having trouble getting products and services for the organization. Uh, whereas on the legal side, Folks are overwhelmed with work. They're constantly getting distracted by yeah. these very routine and repetitive requests. Yeah. Um, legal department leadership has a little visibility into who's doing what within the organization. So we engage with both sides. It could be legal ops. It could be the yeah. GC, deputy GC. It could be someone on the business side, uh, it's, stakeholder. Yeah, there. it's interesting. You, when you were, I was kind of smirking because, like, I've talked to a lot of folks, legal, healthcare, and these on these areas where there's a lot of pain points like this. Um, the common answer is it's like a thousand paper cuts. Yeah. Because you got a salesperson, hey, I got a little contract compliance need, can you check this? When in reality, that's just cycle times on the attorneys. For sure. When a co-pilot could address that basic task, and it's not a chatbot, it's just actually a better answer. And then what's the next best action? This yeah. is kind of the progression we're seeing. What's your reaction to that? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. It's uh, paper cuts is a great way to describe it, and it's uh, it, it's these kind of low hanging types of distractions yeah, yeah. that really sap time from advancing the business imperatives. Yeah, we used to we used to have an expression. I got that question where I should just tape the answer and then hit play. Um, <laughs> but that's what AI is essentially doing. They're essentially automating some of these tasks, and then there's a reasoning side of it uh, that's emerging very quickly. Uh, what does your team look at when you start getting into this whole? Okay, I can do some retrieval. 
Uh, I can match and do some of this low hanging, frequently asked questions kind of thing. But then you start getting into reasoning. Okay, action. What's the next best step? Okay, I got the contract compliance as an example. I'm a sales guy. Yep. I'm, I don't have to wait two weeks for a response or two days or whatever time it takes. Done. Check. Now what? Yeah, so I think one of the really exciting things is there's a tremendous amount of headroom in legal. You can move up the value chain. You you serve more and more of those human-related tasks. Um, those are things we're very focused on in terms of uh, Cohizo is a modular yeah. product. We're yeah. rolling out some work product generation modules yeah. as well to assist in a variety of areas. Where are you guys based out of? So we're a New York-based uh, York based company. How's the journey been for you as an entrepreneur? Obviously, second time around, you were successful, exited at your first startup as an AI in the same area. You got the legal tech, you got a great tech team from Carnegie Mellon. What's the journey been like? Was it like out of the gate, you, you were hitting product market fit? Did you guys have to work a little bit? Take us through your journey uh, in the formation and then ultimately establishing the business. Yeah, so I would say it's it's been very different this time around. Uh, in 2012, a lot of it was convincing attorneys that AI could be useful, really making the market. There was just a, yeah. a couple of our other competitors out there. Uh, this time, it's it, you know in a lot of ways, it's been much faster, um, some ways easier, uh, but there's different challenges. So it's navigating the competitive landscape. It's rising above the kind yeah. of the buzz in the market and some of the hype in the market. Um, it's certainly helpful to, to have had some success, have a network, yeah. uh, both customers, partners, and investors. What are some the of the objections that you run into? I mean, you mentioned obviously ChatGPT helped educate everybody. Okay, see, yeah. it's a new interface. But when you come in, what are some of the objections that you have to overcome? Yeah, so there's always uh, questions around data security. Um, we're SOC 2 compliant. We do routine penetration testing, so we have to get the InfoSec team yeah. comfortable with the platform. Uh, sometimes questions around accuracy, and I think that's just you hear a lot about hallucinations in AI. Uh, as I said, all of these answers are tied very tightly back to the documents. We also have structured the system from a workflow perspective to yeah. work very much in tandem with the attorney. Uh, so as I mentioned, they have a lot of control. They can decide, we want to review the, quest the answer first. It's essentially a, a recommendation, uh, recommended uh, response before they send it back. So human in the loop on the front end with explainability and sourcing. I exactly. That's important, probably legal, you got to back it up. For sure, for sure. And, and a lot of these are, it can get very granular and at the at the legal department's discretion. So for certain types of questions, you may want to always have an attorney involved. You want to dig deep. If someone's asking about a Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, you want to understand what maybe what the underlying situation yeah. is. Um, if it's, uh, you know, if it's a routine kind of more HR related question, hey, how much vacation time do I have? For something like that, you're probably comfortable That's having pretty trivial. AI give a response. Yeah, it's tri pretty trivial, it's pretty static. Share some testimonials, you don't have to name customers. We can if you want, but yeah. uh, what do people say after they deploy it? Like, oh, wow, this has changed my life. Uh, share some anecdotal stories around what you're hearing when after they start using the product. Yeah, so I would say from a legal perspective, uh, we're typically seeing attorneys get back to the business stakeholders anywhere from 25 to 70% faster. Um, so that's great for, the, great for the business side in terms of advancing their business imperatives. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think from you know a lot of the a lot of this work is work attorneys don't want to be doing <laughs> anyway. It's not what they went to law school for. It's not the yeah, yeah. intuitive decision making and providing strategic guidance. So the more we can take off of their plate, and they're the better. seeing that shift where they got more productivity time on stuff they really want to work on. For sure, first the and, mundane tasks and, and things that are more valuable for the business. And I'd say the other thing that's really interesting is just the the insights the um, system surfaces. So. Sometimes, a lot of times, without a system like Cohiso, you don't know how work is flowing through the department. Um, maybe you have someone who's overwhelmed, someone else who doesn't have that much to do. You know, there's maybe a, a salesperson that's the squeaky wheel, always making demands but not adding that much business value. So, all of these types of things can be can be surfaced. Yeah, it's, it's more yeah. data actually, it's throwing up more data. Exactly, and really easy, dig easily digestible data too. As uh, being in in the legal field. Just what's your vision of where this goes? I mean, how does this, I mean, obviously you're the founder, also you understand the legal profession. Um, what's your vision in terms of what a steady state looks like when you look forward, when things are operational, what does that look like? What's that vision? Yeah, so I think there's there'll be a lot of transformation in legal. Um, one of the things that excites me is I think with a tool like Cohizo, it brings a lot more power to the in-house legal department. So um, I think about a decade ago, 40% of corporate legal spend was, or actually 54% of corporate legal spend was going to outside counsel. Yeah, yeah, That's already yeah. been reduced to 40% today. Yeah. Um, and I think this Gen AI will continue yeah. to accelerate this trend, That's bringing the tech That's closer interesting. To I'm sure the outside counsel is like, see their billings drop. Whoa, whoa. 
what's going on here uh, or not. Or Yeah, you know? it'll be fascinating. <laughs> I mean, my prior business sold into law firms, audit consulting firms, corporate legal departments. This one's obviously yeah. focused more on in-house. But I do think there's a real opportunity for law firms to scale their domain expertise yeah. and really focus on the strategic work. What do you say to the folks out there, since you brought that up, because it made me think about it, like for the, for the companies that don't have not reached that threshold, small, medium-sized enterprise, for instance, might not afford it, be able to afford an in-house counsel. Mm. Um, does your tool help um, them? Are there agents, fractional, because you see a lot of fractional legal um, uh, advisors come into firms where they handle one or more accounts. Yeah. How yeah. does that work? Is it a SaaS service? Is it an on-prem? What's the consumption model? Is that something you guys are looking at? Yeah, yeah, so great question. Um, I would say we do engage, our initial thesis was this would be a tool for 10 plus in-house attorneys, so companies of that, that size and scale. Um, we, we are seeing businesses that have a solo GC or just a couple attorneys. We're working with one, uh, two in-house attorneys servicing 10,000 employees. So they're like screaming for a tool like, uh, like Cohizo. Um, that said, we're also working with some firms, to your point, that serve as fractional GCs, essentially as outside in-house counsel for organizations, yeah. um, and they can leverage the same functionality. Yeah, I mean, there's a multiplier effect. I mean, you can have one in-house counsel that could be a 10x now employee. I mean, it used to be an expression a decade ago when cloud hit the scene, you know, the 10x engineer, you hire one engineer with the cloud scale, yeah. you get a 10x value there. It was kind of kicked around for a long time in the valley. Now you're seeing AI bring that 10x plus to Business people, yeah, I mean, for sure. This is where you start to see the action. I exactly, exactly. And I think legal, the legal space is very conducive to that. Well, Ned, great to have you on the cube. Thanks for coming in for our media week, and great to see you at the event. For the last thirty seconds of the segment here, give a quick plug for the company. What are you guys are looking to do? Are you guys raising money? Are you looking for customers? Are you looking to hire? Uh, put a plug in. Give the pitch. Yeah, sure. So again, Cohizo is a legal front door and work management system for in-house legal and compliance teams. We're always looking to engage with innovative companies that want to accelerate their legal processes and add more value for their business stakeholders. Uh, we have just raised some capital, so we're not in the market for that today. But, uh, you know, a year down the line, we'd love to uh, chat with uh, VCs as Get well. Get some revenue, and then you're going to be dealing with offers. Yeah, All right. yeah, yeah, Great for to sure. Great to have yeah. you on. All right. Really nice to talk All right. to you. Thank you. All right, you. we are here. This is the queue in New York City, the New York Stock Exchange, our East Coast super node, our super point of presence. This is going to be expanding out our media infrastructure, doing interviews here. Uh, no story is too small. We'll do whatever it takes to get that story working with the NYSE Wired community and the Cube community together. I'm John Furrier, host of the Cube. Thanks for watching.